church family and guests joining us online, welcome to another edition of Virtual Worship with Pastor Mark. I pray that you and your loved ones are staying healthy and sane. Last Sunday was Easter. Easter celebrates the high point of our faith, Christ's resurrection from the dead. Now on most Easter Sundays, last week of course being the exception, attendance at worship increases on Easter Sunday. The sanctuary is decorated with white Easter lilies, a white cloth is placed over the cross, and the music is especially uplifting and joyful. How do you top a celebration like that? You don't. Today is the first Sunday after Easter. In more liturgical traditions, it is known as Low Sunday. In a typical year, attendance at worship drops on this Sunday. The Easter lilies are gone. The pastor goes on vacation for rest and renewal following all the activities of Lent and Easter. And families who got together to celebrate Easter have returned to their homes and someone is stuck eating another round of leftover ham. As disciples of Jesus Christ, however, we believe that every Sunday, no matter what time of the year, is a little Easter, a little celebration of Christ's resurrection. So join with me today in celebrating Christ's resurrection as we worship and continue to celebrate the good news of Easter. Christ is risen. I can't hear you. Christ is risen indeed. It's the week after Easter. Some call this day a low Sunday. Low in attendance, low in energy, a religious hangover. But this week is not a low Sunday, not to you and not to us. Because we recognize that when the risen Christ burst forth from that tomb, he went on the move and didn't stop moving. Easter kept happening. In fact, nearly one week after his resurrection, Jesus presented himself alive to Thomas, the most famous skeptic in all of history. And he said to him, Here I am. Go on. Touch my hands. Examine. Take your finger and put it in my side. Do what it takes to find belief. Thomas responded, My Lord and my God. Easter kept happening. Easter is not just a one-time phenomenon. The redemptive power that came alive in Christ's resurrection is as powerful and alive today as it was then. When God works in and through our lives, Easter happens. When we invite the stranger, when we help the poor, when we visit the sick, clothe the naked, feed the hungry, or bring peace to those whose hearts are troubled, Easter happens. Whatever excitement and exuberance we experience on Easter Sunday is alive and present and available every day, every hour, every second. Low Sunday? I don't think so. Because Easter keeps happening. Good morning. How are you this morning? Are you staying safe? Do you see how I'm staying safe? I brought my face mask. I have my hand sanitizer. I have my disinfecting wipes. And my Lysol spray. I bet you have seen and heard a lot about the virus that is going around the world. It can be a bit scary. Many people have gotten sick from it. And no, the virus is something you can't see with your eyes. It is very tiny and can spread without you realizing it. So we have to be careful. So when we do things like clean, wash our hands, and use hand sanitizer, we are trying to stay safe. We can't see all the protective stuff in our cleaning supplies but trust that they kill the germs and help us. You know, our lives are a little bit like that. We do sinful things that can harm us. 
and we need protection from our heart. Do you know where we get that? From God, of course. And the great news is that unlike hand sanitizer, we don't have to worry about how effective God's work is because we know that in Jesus we are already made clean. Even when things are uncertain, we don't know what the future holds, but we know who holds the future. We know God is in control. We can't see the virus. We can't always see what causes sin. But God is much greater than sickness, sin, and death. He loves us enough to send Jesus to die and defeat all that. We know our trust in Him will protect us no matter what. We can still be careful and keep ourselves clean and safe, but trust that God is in control. Let us pray. Our gracious and loving God, you know what each one of us is going through right now. And we are thankful that we can come before your glorious throne with our prayers and supplications. We trust that you can take the worst circumstances and turn them around for your good and your glory. You can restore all things. And so we're asking you to restore lost health, lost jobs, lost finances, lost relationships, lost resources, and lost hopes. We ask that you would show those who are struggling with their health and or their finances that you are with them and will provide for them. We ask you to surround them with people who will help and encourage them through this time. Please meet their immediate needs as they trust you for long-term solutions. Grant them your peace and hope for a brighter future. Almighty God, we ask that you would be with our leaders. Grant them wisdom and direction in all the decisions they make. We pray for our healthcare workers and first responders as well as their families. Keep them safe and healthy. O oh Lord, turn our fears into faith as your good plans for our world unfolds. As we wait on you, we ask that you would renew our hope and give us courage to dream again. Remind us all of how much you love us and fill us with your peace that surpasses all understanding. O oh God, come into our lives and into our world. Do what only you can do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of Our scripture reading for today is from John chapter 20, verses 19 through 23. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were to gather with the doors locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Here ends the reading of God's holy word. May God add his blessings to it. Ken Davis, a popular Christian comedian and motivational speaker, tells the story about a woman who looked out her window and saw her German Shepherd dog shaking the life out of a neighbor's rabbit. Now her family did not get along well with these neighbors, so this was going to be like a, a total disaster. She grabbed a broom, pummeled the dog until it dropped the now extremely dead rabbit out of its mouth. And she panicked. She didn't know what else to do. So she, she grabbed a rabbit, she took it inside, she gave it a bath, blow dried it to its original fluffiness, combed it until the rabbit was looking good, snuck into the neighbor's yard, and propped the rabbit back up in its cage. An hour later, she heard screams coming from next door. She asked her neighbor, what's going on? Our rabbit, our rabbit, her neighbor cried. He died two weeks ago. We buried him, and now he's back. <laughs> Today is the first Sunday after Easter, the, the day when we celebrate the good news that Jesus is back. No German shepherd dug up his lifeless body. No, the power of God raised Jesus Christ from the dead. And although one week has passed since Easter, today's scripture reading from John chapter 20 takes place on that first Easter evening. The disciples had gathered themselves together following their scattering in the Garden of Gethsemane on the night when Jesus was arrested. And they had come together and they had locked the doors to the house they had gathered in for fear of the Jews. Now today, like Jesus' disciples, we are gathered in our homes out of fear. Not fear of persecution for our faith, but fear of contracting the deadly COVID-19 coronavirus. We know that the virus spreads from contact with other persons, and so the more we isolate ourselves from others, the safer we are. Now after Jesus' disciples, now after Jesus had been arrested, his disciples no longer felt safe. They were afraid. Simon Peter and the other disciples were probably afraid of guilt by association. And they were afraid that the same people who crucified Jesus would now come after them. And so on the evening of that first Easter, they had gathered in a home to stay safe. And they were probably hiding out in the upper room where just a few days ago they had celebrated the Passover with Jesus. Now John tells us that they were hiding out behind locked doors for fear of the Jews. 
They locked the doors to avoid persecution from Jewish leaders. They locked the doors to try to find some sense of security. They locked the doors so that they could feel safe in a frightening world. And you know what? The locked doors worked. They were protected from their enemies. The Jewish leaders couldn't get to them, but neither could they get to anyone else. Their fear of persecution protected them from their enemies, but it also cut them off from the joy and fellowship and mission that Jesus had given them. There was no preaching the kingdom of God while they were safe behind locked doors. There was no teaching the crowds while they were secure, hidden from the rest of the world. There was no healing the sick and casting out demons while they remained behind locked doors. There was no witness to the resurrection of Jesus Christ while they remained safe and secure behind locked doors. But that was the price they were willing to pay to, save, to stay safe in their frightening world. And even though centuries have passed, fear still locks the doors on Christian lives. And fear still threatens to extinguish the mission of the church. We fear a world where deadly viruses quickly spread across the globe, leaving hundreds of thousands of people dead in their wake. We fear a world that increasingly hates Christians and Christian values. We hear true stories of Christians right here in the United States being fined for gathering to worship at a drive-in movie theater with the windows rolled up on their cars during this COVID-19 pandemic while Planned Parenthood centers remain open to perform abortions. Go figure. We fear sharing our faith with those who do not believe as we do. We may offend them. They may laugh at us. They may reject us. And we want to be accepted and considered, quote, normal. And thus we keep a low profile about Jesus and what he means to us. We want to feel safe, and we think that the only way to feel safe is to close the doors and remain locked behind those doors. Now, we do not know how long Jesus' disciples would have remained locked in their safe space before finally letting their guard down and deciding to emerge from their cocoon. Indeed, we will never know because Jesus does not leave us alone in our safe and secure space behind locked doors. Instead, Jesus does the unthinkable. He suddenly appears before them in spite of locked doors. In the midst of their secure, tightly locked safe space, Jesus came and greeted them with a message of peace. We read in John chapter 20, verses 19 and 20. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for the fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And after he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side, and the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Peace be with you. Now this was an everyday greeting of the Jews in Palestine. Shalom, peace be with you. But this ordinary greeting was filled with extraordinary meaning when Jesus uttered it on that first Easter evening. Peace was now possible for Jesus' death on the cross made peace with God a reality. The Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 5 verse 8, God demonstrates his own love for us in this, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ. Because of the cross, we have peace with God. On the night when Jesus was arrested, Jesus predicted that all of his disciples would become deserters. And they did, just as Jesus said. Remember Judas? He not only deserted Jesus, he sold him to the Jewish leaders for 30 pieces of silver. And you remember Peter? Peter denied he had anything to do with Jesus three times before the cock crowed twice. And Judas and 
Peter and James and John, all the other disciples, all of them panicked and deserted Jesus to flee to a place of safety. All of them broke their relationship with Jesus. None of them remained a faithful disciple on that night. And one could only imagine how they felt, locked in behind closed doors. They were scared of being found by the Jewish leaders. They were afraid that they too might be caught and crucified. But on top of that fear, there must have also been feelings of guilt. They had deserted Jesus. And on top of those feelings of fear and guilt, they must, also, they must have also felt ashamed of their actions. They must have regretted what they did. But Jesus came into their presence with a message of reconciliation. Peace be with you. Jesus stood before his disciples who had earlier deserted him as their friend and master. He did not come back to condemn them for their sins. Rather, he came to save them and empower them to continue his mission. He was alive. And their grief and their fear was turned into joy when they saw the risen Lord and accepted his greeting. Peace be with you. Now there is an important point for us to see here. That same Jesus who brought a message of peace, a message of reconciliation to those disciples locked in the upper room. That same risen Lord is with you in your safe place, saying to you today, peace be with you. Jesus knows that we have all panicked and deserted him at some time in our life. He knows that we have all failed him. He knows that we, like the disciples in the upper room, are living in fear. In fear of becoming infected with COVID-19 and dying. In fear of losing our jobs. In fear of going broke. In fear of a frightening world. And yet the risen Lord comes to us bearing a message of salvation. Peace be with you. And then in verse 21, Jesus says, As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. The time had now come for the disciples to continue his work in the world. There was more work that needed to be done. The gospel needed to be preached to those who had never heard the good news of Jesus Christ. It needed to be proclaimed to the Gentiles. And there was still more teaching that needed to be done. New converts would need to be taught about life in the kingdom of God. Both new and old believers would need to learn what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. There were people who were sick and dying who needed to be healed. There was more work that needed to be done, but it would not get done as long as the disciples remained quarantined behind locked doors in their safe place. It would not get done as long as they feared failing. A troubled man paid a visit to his rabbi. A wise and good old rabbi, as all rabbis tend to be. Rabbi, he said, wringing his hands, I am a failure. More than half the time, I do not succeed in doing what I must do. So I'm afraid to try anything. Oh, said the rabbi. Please, say something, wise rabbi, said the man. After much pondering, the rabbi spoke as follows. Ah, my son, I give you wisdom. Go and look on page 930 of the New York Times Almanac for the year 1970, and you will find peace of mind. Me. Okay, said the man. And he went away, and he did just that very thing. Now this is what he found. The listing of the lifetime batting averages of all the greatest baseball players. Ty Cobb, the greatest of all time, had a lifetime batting average of only 366. Even Babe Ruth didn't do so good. So the man went back to his rabbi and in a questioning tone said, Ty Cobb, 366? That's it? Right, said the rabbi. Ty Cobb, 366. He got one hit out of every three times at bat. He didn't even bat 500. So what can you expect already? Ah, said the man who thought he was a wretched failure because only half the time he did not succeed at what he must do. Most of us fear failure. We fear trying something and falling flat on our faces. And we can sympathize with these disciples living in the security of a safe place. But there is work for us to do. 
It doesn't take a seminary degree to realize how much need there is in this world for the gospel of Jesus Christ. There are many living right here in North America who have never heard of Jesus Christ. And they need to hear the good news that Jesus saves, that Jesus is alive. And there's also great need for teaching the Bible, not just to new believers, but to all of us. A few years ago, a test of Bible knowledge was given to five classes of high school seniors. Most of them failed the exam completely. Some were so confused that they thought Sodom and Gomorrah were lovers, or that the Gospels were written by Matthew, Mark, Luther, and John. Others said that Eve was created from the apple, And that the stories Jesus used in teaching were called parodies. I mean, there's so much in the Bible that we don't know or don't apply in our lives. Husbands need to learn what the Bible says about loving their wives. And wives need to learn what the Bible says about loving their husbands. Parents need to learn what the Bible says about instructing their children in the way of the Lord. And children need to learn how to honor their parents and obey the commandments of the Lord. We have work to do. All of us need to study God's Word so that we can share God's love with others. And there's also other work that needs to be done. The hungry need to be fed. The thirsty need to be given something to drink. The stranger needs to be welcomed. The naked need to be clothed. Those who are sick need to be cared for. Those in prison need to be visited. And the list could go on and on. Jesus needs us to continue His ministry in this world. And yet social distancing guidelines are making it much more difficult. In some cases, almost impossible to do what Jesus is calling us to do. Our church recently received a letter from CAM, Coordinated Assistant Ministries here in Kokomo, asking for help because they had to cancel significant March and April fundraisers due to COVID-19 restrictions. And now they're in dire need of financial support to make it through the next few months. And I'm sure that there are many other ministries that are struggling financially because our our focus has turned inward on ourselves, doing all we can to remain safe and healthy. But as long as we remain behind our locked doors, as long as we remain self-quarantined in our own cocoons, isolated from the rest of society, as long as our focus remains on our own personal well-being, Jesus' ministry waits to get done. As long as we fear going out into a COVID-19 world, then there will be no preaching, no teaching, no feeding the hungry, no giving the thirsty something to drink, no witnessing that Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. And so in verse 22... Jesus invited the disciples to receive the Holy Spirit. Right after Jesus gave them their marching order, he invited them to receive the Holy Spirit, for it is impossible to do one without the other. It's impossible for us to continue Jesus' ministry in this world without also receiving the empowering of his Holy Spirit. And it was Jesus Christ's Spirit, the, the Holy Spirit breathed upon them that set them free from the safe and stagnant upper room to go out and to start being the church. And the disciples witnessed, and they healed, and they exhorted, and they did wonders in the name of the risen Lord. And the church increased daily. They knew the security and freedom of being under God's control. Now, one of the blessings of modern technology is that we can still be the church with some limitations due to social distancing guidelines. Where 40 people may attend worship service here at the Kokomo Church of the Brethren and 25 people at Parkview Mennonite Church, our virtual worship services are being viewed around 100 times per worship service. I've been trying to get a certain person to join us for worship on Sunday morning for a number of years. And I was talking with them the other day and they told me, you finally did it, Pastor. You finally got me to attend church. I'm watching the virtual worship services. Well, praise the Lord. The more time that passes, the more people who are watching our worship services, hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ and learning how to live life in God's kingdom. And I'm also hearing how members are calling each other more now than ever before and and checking in on their brothers and sisters in Christ. 
And that's what the body of Christ should be doing all the time. Every crisis is an opportunity, and this COVID-19 pandemic is an opportunity for us to be the body of Christ in ways that we might not have imagined before. The risen Lord's words to us today in the midst of this COVID-19 pandemic are the same as they were to his disciples. Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. Receive the Holy Spirit. Now some say yes to God's gracious invitation and it shows in their words and actions. Others said yes and meant it sometime in the past, but fear or love of this present world has gradually shut the door on the Spirit, and that too shows. And some of us have understood what it means to be used and filled by the Spirit. But God's Word is the same to all of us. Receive the Holy Spirit, and God will replace your fear of those outside your safe space with the power to transform them. Christ will turn your fear of being noticed into openness and joy. Receive the Holy Spirit and you should be witnesses to Christ's resurrection unto the ends of the earth. So which will you choose? The closed doors of a safe space or hearts open to the gift of the Spirit? Suffocating in your own defenses or drawing breath from the life of God? Will your life be spent making excuses or making disciples? Greet the risen Christ with joy. Receive the peace that comes from Him and go forward in the power of His Spirit to love and serve others. Amen. were barred and the windows fastened down I spent the night in sleeplessness and rose at every sound half in hopeless sorrow and half in fear the day would find the soldiers breaking through to drag us all away Just before the sunrise, I heard something at the wall. A gate began to rattle, and a voice began to call. I hurried to the window, looked down into the street, expecting swords and torches and the sound of soldiers' feet. There was no one there but Mary So I went down to let her in John stood there beside me And she told us where she'd been She said they'd moved him in the night And none of us knows where The stone's been rolled away And now his body isn't there So we both ran to the garden and John ran on ahead We found the stone and the empty tomb Just the way that Mary said The winding sheet they wrapped him in Was just an empty shell And how or where they'd taken him Was more than I could tell Something strange had happened there just what I did not know John believed a miracle But I just turned to go Circumstance and speculation Couldn't lift me very high For I'd seen them crucify him And then I saw him die Back inside the house again 
the guilt and anguish came Everything I'd promised him just added to my shame When at last it came to choices I denied I knew his name And even if he was alive It wouldn't be the same And suddenly the air was filled with a strange and sweet perfume Light that came from everywhere drove shadows from the room And Jesus stood before me with his arms held open wide And I fell down on my knees and I just clung to him and cried Then he raised me to my feet And as I looked into his eyes The love was shining out from him Like sunlight from the skies Guilt in my confusion Disappeared in sweet release And every fear I ever had Just melted into peace He's alive Thank you for joining me today for another edition of Virtual Worship with Pastor Mark. I hope you can join me again in the near future. Until then, may God bless you and your loved ones. Thank you and God bless you.